If we want to understand emotions, we have to look at where emotions first develop. In fact, this is a critical central theme if you want to understand brain science and psychology. There's a rule in neuroanatomy. Because if you look at 50 different brains of humans or you compare the brains of dogs and humans, there are a lot of differences. Certain things are the same, but certain things are different. And the rule that every good neuroanatomist knows is that if you want to understand what a part of the brain does, you have to address two questions. First, you have to know what connections does that brain area make? What is it connected to? Where does it get inputs from? And where does it send inputs? So for instance, if there's an area of the brain that gets direct input from the neurons in the nose, you can be pretty certain that it has some role in analyzing smell, in measuring something about odors or analyzing something about odors. Now, if it also gets input from the eye, you can also conclude that it gets input from the visual system, that it cares about light and photons. This is sort of obvious. And yet you need to know that connectivity and you need to know what's called the developmental origin of that structure. You need to know where it was early in development because things move around a lot as the brain develops. The brain, of course, is this more or less squishy thing floating around in some liquid that's stuffed inside your skull. And as a consequence, things move around a lot. They are not always in the same place in two uh, different species or two individuals of the same species. So you have to know where they started out because where they started out informs what they do as well. And when we're talking about emotions, we cannot point to one area of the brain. We can't say that's the area of the brain that's responsible for emotions. There is this so-called limbic system that has been linked to emotions in various ways. We're gonna talk about that today. But the limbic system is just one component of the inputs to create emotions. It's not the place for emotions. You can't go in and lesion one location in the brain and eliminate emotions entirely. It just doesn't work that way. So first of all, we have to ask, what are the circuits for emotion? What are the brain areas for emotion? And nowadays there's a lot of debate about this. For years, it was thought that there might be circuits, meaning connections in the brain that generate the feeling of being happy or circuits that generate the feeling of being sad, et cetera. That's been challenged. In fact, Lisa Feldman Barrett has been the person who's really challenged this head on and has very good evidence for the fact that such circuits probably don't exist. And yet, I think there's good evidence for circuits in the brain, such as limbic circuits and other circuits that shift our overall states or our overall level of alertness or calmness or whether or not they bias us toward viewing the outside world or paying more attention to what's going on inside our bodies. If none of this makes sense right now, I promise it will make sense soon. But the important thing to understand is that emotions do arise in the brain and body. They arise because there are specific connections between specific areas in the brain and body. And if we want to understand how emotions work, we have to look how emotions are built. And they are built during infancy, adolescence, and puberty. And then it continues into adulthood, but the groundwork is laid down early in development when we are small children. So let's think about what happens to a baby that comes into the world. A baby comes into the world, you were born into this world without really any understanding of the things around you. Now, there are two ways that you can interact with the world and you're always doing them more or less to some degree at the same time. Those are interoception, paying attention to what's going on inside you, what you feel internally and exteroception, paying attention to what's going on outside you. Hold that in mind, please, because the fact that you're both interocepting and exterocepting is true for your entire life and it sets the foundation for understanding emotions. It's absolutely critical. As an infant, you didn't have any knowledge of what you needed. You didn't understand hunger. You didn't understand toys when you first came into the world. You didn't understand cold or heat or any of that. When you needed something, you experienced that as anxiety. You would feel an increase in alertness if you had to use the bathroom. You would feel an increase in alertness if you were hungry and you would vocalize, you would cry out, you would act agitated, you might coo, you might do a number of different things, but all you knew was what you were feel, feeling internally and then your caregiver, whoever that might've been, would respond to that. 
So you would feel some agitation. A caregiver would come and make a decision. Oh, you need food and give you milk or change your diaper or wrap you in a blanket if you were cold. But they didn't know if you were cold. They could just assume that you were cold. So this is actually really important to understand that a baby, when you were a baby and when I was a baby, we didn't have any sense of the outside world except that it responded to our acts of anxiety, essentially. Now, this isn't Freudian theory, right? It's, it, there are components of it that are embedded in Freudian theory, but all developmental psychologists agree that babies lack the ability to make cognitive sense of the outside world. But in this feeling of anxiety and registering one's own internal state and then crying out to the outside world, either through crying or subtle vocalizations or even just cooing, making some noise, we start to develop a relationship with the outside world in which our internal states, our shifts in anxiety, start to drive requests and people come and respond to those requests, hopefully. And the reason I say hopefully is that we've all heard presumably about these cases of neglect. There are a lot of cases where if you neglect a baby, you neglect an adolescent or a teenager, development doesn't go well. And we'll touch on some of those, but those are really extreme cases. They're sort of like the parallel to experiments that are often done in the laboratory with animals, where you've probably heard of these enriched environments where they'll give mice a bunch of toys and they'll give them um, some different foods every once in a while and they'll house them together with other mice. And then what you find is that the animals... They will say, oh, you know, their brain is thicker and their neurons have more branches to them and all that. But that's really comparing deprivation with normalcy. What we want to center on today instead is what happens when things go well and why things might not go well in certain circumstances is interesting, but to me, not as interesting as what healthy emotional development looks like. And if you haven't achieved healthy emotional development, what can be done as an intervention at later times in order to rescue that? So the baby, you as a baby, you're flopping around there in your crib, you're getting care where you, where you need it and when you need it, presumably. And this gets to the basis of what emotions are about, which are emotions are really about forming bonds and being able to predict things in the world. That's really what emotions are about. Whether or not the baby feels angry or happy or sad, we don't know. We can guess, but we don't know. In fact, most of the time, we don't even know how we feel, let alone how other people feel. And that's true for adults. So if I ask you how you feel right now, I don't know that you could tell me in any kind of rich language that would I would say, oh, I really understand. If you said you were very, very depressed or very, very happy, I'd have some sense because of how extreme that is, but I don't know that I would really know. And I don't think you know how I feel right now either. I could be furious right now, or I could be very happy. You don't have any idea. Now, of course, we have these things called expressions. Our pupils dilate. There are various cues of how people feel. We're gonna talk about those cues, but you really don't know. And at this point, I actually just wanna pause and mention a really interesting tool that is trying to address this question of what are emotions and what do they consist of that you can use if you like. This is an app, I didn't develop it, I don't have any relationship to them, but the app was developed by people at Yale, um, by groups at Yale who do research and it's called Mood Meter and it's actually quite interesting. I think it's either free or it's 99 cents. Again, I, no business relationship to them, but what they're trying to do is put more nuance, more subtlety on our, words and our language for, for emotions and be able to, to allow you to predict how you're going to feel in the future. And it's actually quite interesting. I'm on the app right now, and I know you can't see this, but um, it's called Mood Meter. And um, you can find it on Apple or Android. And you go into it and it asks you, you know, it says to me, hi, Andrew, how are you right now? And I click the little tab that says, I feel. And I can either pick high energy and unpleasant, high energy and pleasant, low energy, unpleasant, or low energy, pleasant. And I would say right now, I feel high energy, pleasant. So I just revealed to you how I feel. So I click on that and then it gives you a gallery of colors and you just move your finger to the location where you think it matches most. And as you do that, little words pop up. I know some people are looking at this on, or listening to this on audio only. So say motivated, cheerful, inspired. I would say I'm feeling right now cheerful. So you click that. And then you just go to the next window and it just says, what are you doing? And I, this feels like play to me, but I'm going to call it work. And then that's it. And then um, what it does is it basically starts to collect data on you. You're giving it information and it starts to link that to other features 
that you allow it access to if you like. And it starts helping you be able to predict how you're going to feel at different times of day. It's actually quite accurate in um, certain ways, quite interesting. And it points to a couple really interesting features, which is that we don't really have enough language to describe all the emotional states. And yet there's some core truths to what makes up an emotion. 